John Martin Scripps was born in Letchworth, Hertfordshire, in the United Kingdom, in December 1959, the second-born child to his parents, Leonard and Jean Scripps. He had an elder sister named Janet. The family relocated to London for work purposes when he was very young, and it was said that as a young boy he idolised his father. He would often travel around with his father, who was a truck driver, and this is how he developed a love for travelling and experiencing new places. However, when Martin was only nine, his father took his own life, which impacted Martin severely. Martin was known to really struggle in school. He had problems with reading and writing and was later diagnosed with dyslexia and ended up leaving school when he was only 15 since he struggled so much. Martin was known as mild-mannered, reserved and polite, but it was said that he had no close friends. After dropping out of school, he continued to travel, raising money for his trips by doing odd jobs and selling antiques. But Martin did not always try to make money in law-abiding ways, and he did not always pay for the antiques that he would later sell. Martin committed his first crime in May 1974, when he was only 15 and soon after he left school. He was tried in juvenile court and sentenced to a 12-month conditional discharge and fined 10 pounds. But this punishment did not deter him from stealing and by August 1976 he had committed three more burglaries. In June of 1978 he was tried for the first time as an adult for indecent assault but received no sentencing and was once again only fined 40 pounds. Afterward, he committed more burglaries in London, followed by being in jail in Israel for stealing from a fellow kibbutz worker. In 1980, when Scripps was 21, he married Maria Pilar Arellanos from Cancun, Mexico, who was only 16 years old, while he had been traveling through her town. They traveled together for two years until in 1982 when he was sentenced to three years in prison for theft, burglary and resisting arrest. In 1985, only a few months short of finishing his sentence, he absconded while on home leave and committed another burglary, which is when Maria filed for divorce. Martin was rearrested and after his release, he changed his name to John Martin by way of deed poll. Maria went on to marry a police constable of the Royal Protection Squad. This angered Martin a lot, and he acted in revenge and stole clothing from her new husband while he was once again released on home leave. The harassment continued, and he was only appeased when she divorced her new husband and returned to her hometown in Mexico. Martin travelled to Southeast Asia and America and started moving drugs for a syndicate to Europe. And in 1987, he was arrested at Heathrow Airport for drug possession. When he was arrested, police found a key that belonged to a safety deposit box in a bank from which they seized drugs worth around $1 million and Martin was subsequently sentenced to seven years in prison. In June 1990, he absconded again whilst on home leave, but he was arrested again in November 1990, once again for drug possession. And in July 1992, the Winchester Crown Court added another six years to Martin's original sentence which would have kept him behind bars until 2001. He was incarcerated at Albany Prison on the Isle of Wight from February 1992 to August of 1993. He was said to be a model prisoner while there, and initially he did menial jobs such as dishwashing and general cleaning, but he was later promoted to be a butcher. He was trained by a prison caterer with more than 20 years experience and another inmate who had been a professional butcher. They taught him how to dismember and remove the bone from animals after slaughtering them. Martin performed his duties with such efficiency that he once told those friends of his that he had wanted to open a butchery after he was released. 
On the 20th of August 1993, Martin was transferred from Albany Prison to Mound Prison in Hampstead, Hertfordshire, due to a change in his security categorization, which allowed him to be moved to a lower level security prison. In October of 1994, he escaped again while on home leave. His home leave had been granted only two days after he had been refused parole. Even before he was granted leave, there were signs that doing so would be a mistake. According to his mother, he had sold all his belongings to fellow inmates while in prison, which to her was a clear indication of his intention to escape. She asked prison authorities not to release him, but they did, and Martin escaped. To avoid being recaptured, he used the birth certificate of another inmate that he stole, Simon James Davis, to get a passport in Davis's name. Within a month of his escape, he turned up in Mexico as John Martin. He reported to the British Embassy that he had lost his passport and he managed to get a replacement. He was determined to regain Maria's love and even persuaded her to move into a flat with him that he had rented. Martin started travelling again and arrived in Singapore from San Francisco on March the 8th, 1995. There he met a man by the name of Gerard Lowe. Gerard George Lowe came from Johannesburg, South Africa and was a chemical engineer with South African breweries. His purpose for the trip to Singapore was to shop for electrical and electronic goods. Before he left Johannesburg on the 7th of March 1995, he told his wife Vanessa, a local airline employee, that his exact schedule would be communicated with her, telling her, I will call you the moment I check into the hotel to give you the contact number. If you do not hear from me on 10 March, it would mean that I would have a seat on a plane to return to you in South Africa and would arrive home on the 11th of March. But if I do call you on the 10th of March, that would mean that I have not managed to get a seat and would return on the 12th of March. When Gerard arrived at Singapore Changi Airport on the morning of 8 March, he was approached by Martin who was using the assumed name of Simon Davis. He struck up a conversation with Gerard and suggested that they share a room, to which Gerard agreed. They managed to book room 1511 in the Riverview Hotel off Havelock Road, but the next morning Martin asked a hotel receptionist to delete Gerard's name from the room because he had kicked him out on the previous night for making sexual advances towards him. Martin checked out on the 11th of March and flew to Bangkok the same day. On 13 March 1995, a pair of legs severed at the knees was found in a plastic bag floating off Clifford Pier. Three days later, a pair of thighs and a torso were found in the same area, also in a plastic bag. Initially, Singapore police could only determine that the body parts belonged to someone Caucasian but they later received a possible name when they received a missing persons report for Gerard Lowe from the South African High Commission, which his wife Vanessa Lowe had filed. She had been extremely distressed since her husband would make daily contact with his family when he was overseas, but he had not called her for a number of days and he had not returned to South Africa by 12 March as he had indicated to her. Gerard's colleagues at his work also tried to determine his whereabouts through personal contacts in Singapore, but they had no luck. On 1 April, the body parts were determined to be that of Gerard George Lowe. Unfortunately, his head and arms had never been found. Sheila May Demood was 49 years old and her son Darren John Demood was 23. They came from British Columbia, Canada. She was an administrator at the Pacific Christian School in Victoria and Darren was a college student. The mother and son were going to Thailand on holiday while Darren was on spring break. Darren flew to Asia first before Sheila met him in Bangkok. 
they flew to Phuket on 15 March on the same flight as Martin, who was still using the assumed name of Simon Davis. He sat on the same row as them on the plane and befriended the two. And afterward, they all checked into the same hotel, Nelis Marina Inn, that face Patong Beach. Martin was given room 48 and the Demutes were given the adjacent room to his, room number 43. The next morning, 16 March, the Demutes were seen having breakfast at the hotel. At around 11 a.m., Martin asked the inn's receptionist to switch from room 42 to 43 as the Demutes had decided to leave and that he would pay their bill. Martin checked out of the inn on 19 March and returned to Singapore that same day. On the very same day, the skulls of the Demutes were found in a disused tin mine in Katu. Martin was arrested when he arrived at Changi Airport on the evening of 19 March 1995 and produced a passport with the assumed name Simon Davis. Police had put the name on their wanted list on 14 March after they determined that Gerard Lowe had checked into the Riverview Hotel with someone by that name. When he was arrested, the police found five passports on Martin in addition to his own. Two British passports issued to Simon Davis. Two Canadian passports issued to Sheila and Darren Damood and a South African passport issued to George Lowe. Each of these had Martin's photograph affixed to them. They also found credit cards belonging to Sheila Demood and Gerard Lowe. In addition to all of this, police found Simon Davis's birth certificate, a hammer weighing 1.5 kilograms or 3.3 pounds, a battery-operated Z Force 3 electroshock weapon, a can of mace, two pairs of handcuffs, a pair of thumb cuffs, two police brand foldable knives, an oil stone and two Swiss army knives. In a police interview room in the airport, Martin smashed a glass panel and cut his wrist with a shard of glass in an attempt to take his own life, fearing that he would be hanged and was taken to a hospital for treatment. On the 21st of March 1995, Martin was taken to court on an initial charge, naming him still as Simon James Davis and accusing him of forging Gerard Lowe's signature on a DBS bank credit card transaction slip to obtain $6,000 in cash on the 9th of March. Three days later, on the 24th of March, he was charged under his real name for the murder of Gerard Lowe that was believed to have taken place sometime between 8 and 9 March. In subsequent hearings, he was additionally charged with forgery for forging Lowe's signature five more times to obtain cash and goods worth $3,200, vandalism for smashing the glass panel, possession of an offensive weapon for the electroshock weapon and possession of a controlled substance since he had 24 sticks of cannabis at the time of his arrest. On 24 March, a torso and a pair each of arms and legs were found along Banai Drang Road, 9.7 kilometers or 6 miles away from where the skulls of Sheila and Darren were found. The body parts were so badly decomposed that visual identification was impossible and dental records and forensic analysis had to be used to conclude that the torso, arms and legs were likely to be Sheila's and the skulls were those of both Sheila and Darren. The other parts of Darren's body was never found. On the 18th of September, a prelim inquiry in a district court was held to determine whether there was sufficient evidence for a trial to proceed. The magistrate overseeing this inquiry ordered Martin to stand trial for Gerard Lowe's murder on 2nd October. 
after hearing statements from 39 witnesses and looking at more than 100 exhibits and 100 photographs that the prosecution had prepared as evidence. Before Martin's trial started, on the 4th of April, he made a statement where he explained that he had killed Gerard Lowe in self-defense. According to him, he had fallen asleep after checking in, but woke up when someone was touching his buttocks. He stated that as he awoke, he saw Lowe wearing only his underwear and smiling at him. He said that this behavior indicated to him that Lowe was making sexual advances towards him, so he kicked him away which angered Lowe to the point where he picked up Martin's hammer and threw it at his stomach. Martin then took the hammer and hit Lowe several times on the head until he collapsed onto the carpeted floor. He said that he then fled in a taxi to the Sentosa Hotel, where a British friend of his was staying, and he confessed to him that he accidentally killed Lowe. His friend told Martin that he would help him and the friend ended up going to the Riverview Hotel and disposed of Lowe's body by throwing it into the Singapore River. He stated, I'm not sure what the next thing I did was. Everything was such a blur to me after this incident that I was walking around in a dream world for the next few days. Martin refused to identify his so-called friend, saying, I cannot tell you his identity because he would harm my family back in Britain. He says that on 15 March, he flew to Phuket where he met up with that very same friend and that he was in fact the one that gave him the passports and the other items belonging to the Demuds, and he swore that he had never met them. Martin's trial started on the 2nd of October 1995. He did not enter a plea but claimed trial, which in Singapore law meant that he was contesting the charges. The trial was presided over by a judge, as Singapore does not have trial by jury. The defense claimed that Martin did not intend to kill Lowe. Martin argued that he was not a violent person and stated, I may have worked in the butchery, but cutting up a human body is another thing. When I saw the photographs of Lowe's body parts, it made me feel sick. He maintained that he had killed Lowe after the latter made sexual advances towards him. He said that these advances caused him to freak out as he had previously fended off sexual attacks, twice whilst he was imprisoned, once in Israel in 1978 and in England in 1994. When he was asked what he did after killing Lowe, he said that he could not remember anything because he had drunk heavily and consumed loads of Valium since Lowe died until he was arrested. He also maintained that he had never met the Demudes and that he most certainly did not kill them. He stated that the reason he had come back to Singapore from Phuket was to clear his conscience about Lowe's death. The prosecution claimed that Scripps had committed premeditated murder and that the motive for killing Lowe was robbing him, not to ward off an unwanted sexual attack. They showed a notebook and tracing paper filled with practice signatures of Lowe's name, showing that Martin had practiced forging Lowe's signature. They also produced receipts from a shopping spree where Martin used Lowe's credit card to buy a video cassette recorder hi-fi stereo speakers and expensive running shoes, as well as a payment made for a classical concert, also with Lowe's credit card. This was cited as evidence of premeditation and a rebuttal of him walking around in a dream world as he had stated after the murder. And the reason that he in fact came back to Singapore was due to an unfinished transaction where he wanted to deposit a large amount of Lowe's money into an American account that belonged to him. The prosecution also produced evidence of Martin having signed a Riverview Hotel restaurant bill on the night of 8 March, when he said that he was supposedly at the hotel of his friend in Sentosa, and stated that his friend did in fact not even exist, but 
Martin continued to insist that the friend most certainly did exist. They also produced statements from two hotel cleaners describing a strange smell in room 1511 when they made up the room between March 9 and March 11. They also produced a statement from a hotel security guard stating that he witnessed Martin leaving the hotel with a large suitcase early on the morning of 11 March and then returning without it around 15 minutes later. With these statements, the prosecution implied that Lowe's body was stored in the room for a number of days and then was disposed of by Martin himself and not the so-called friend. On the 7th of November, the judge adjourned the trial for three days to consider his verdict and when the trial resumed on the 10th of November, the judge was satisfied that the prosecution had made its case and dismissed Martin's version of events. He found Martin guilty and sentenced him to death. In his verdict, he stated, I'm satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that Martin had intentionally killed Lowe. After that, he disarticulated Lowe's body into separate parts and was obviously him that disposed of the body parts by throwing them into the river behind the hotel. On the evidence, I had no difficulty to find that it was Martin who was concerned with the deaths of Sheila and Darren and with the disposal of their body parts found in different sites in Phuket. The disarticulation of the body parts of Lowe, Sheila and Darren have the hallmark signs of having been done by the same person. Altogether, this similar fact evidence reinforces the decision that I have made for it puts beyond doubt that Martin is guilty on the charge of murder. The sentence of this court upon you is that you will be taken from this place to a lawful prison and taken to a place to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. On the 15th of November 1995, Martin announced that he would appeal against his sentence, but he ended up dropping it on the 4th of January 1996, four days before it was to have been heard, without any explanation. He also turned down a chance to petition the President of Singapore for clemency, saying that he was impatient to be executed. In the days and weeks before his execution, Scripps was being held in solitary confinement on death row at Changi and spent most of his time watching television. He also wrote a series of misspelled notes where he spoke of an emptiness inside him and lamented that no one had loved him besides his family and his ex-wife Maria. This is one of his notes and the spelling is exactly as he put it down. One day poor one day rich. Money fills the pain of hunger, but what will fill the emptiness inside? I know that love is beyond me, so do I give myself to God, the God that has betrayed me. Can I be a person again? Only time will tell me. You may take my life for what it is worth, but grant those that I love peace and happiness. He also complained that in prison, you are told every day that you are not a member of the human race. The week before he was due to hang, he dreamed that he had avoided the sentence by taking his own life. Martin's mother was also asked to give her thoughts on Martin's execution and she said, whoever he is now, he's the person the prison service trained him to be. These bastards have no right to take my son's life. I brought him into the world. I'm the only one who can take him out of it. No one formally protested against Martin's execution. The British government also decided to not submit a plea for clemency from the Singapore government. Scripps had turned down a request from the London Scotland Yard to interview him. British police detectives believe that he is linked to the disappearance of management consultant Timothy McDowell, who was 28. He went missing while holidaying in Belize in Central America. 
Scotland Yard suspects that Mr. McDowell was possibly murdered and his body, which was never found, dumped into a crocodile-infested river by Scripps. They found a substantial amount of money transferred from Mr. McDowell's bank account to Scripps's bank account in Britain after his arrest in Singapore. This sum of money was later moved to another account, also under Scripps's name, in the United States. It was in those months in Cancun, Mexico, that he met Timothy McDowell. And she told me she spoke about Timothy McDowell. She said, you know, he, John used to go out and play or scuba dive with him and go out and partying with him on a number of occasions. And then Timothy McDowell just disappeared. And one day, Scripps came in and his expression had changed, his mood had changed. He was off. He, he, she knew he was going to go and she didn't know why. But I suspect it's prob it was the, the day he killed Timothy McDowell. Four days before his execution, in an interview with criminologist Christopher Berry D. Martin described in detail how he murdered Gerard Lowe and then dismembered his body. At dawn on 19 April 1996, after having his last meal of pizza and hot chocolate, 36-year-old John Martin Scripps was hanged in Changi Prison. On that day, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Royal Thai Police closed their files on the murder of Sheila and Darren Demood, declaring the case as solved. When Martin's ex-wife Maria heard that he had been hanged, she stated, John disappeared on several trips and went to the United States and Southeast Asia. I knew something awful was happening, but I could not believe that he had started killing people. I knew something like this would happen to John, but I didn't know that it would hurt so much. The last memory I have of him is a message he sent promising we would meet in the next life and that he would never let me go again. At the time of his execution, Martin became the first Briton to be executed in Singapore since the nation's independence from British colonial rule in 1959. He was also one of the first Europeans to receive the death penalty in Singapore. Martin was also thought to have been involved in several other murders, including San Francisco and Arizona, but he was never charged and it could never be proved. Martin's killing spree and the way that he disarticulated the bodies also gained him the name of the Garden City Butcher. So that is where we will end it for today. As always, thank you so much for clicking on this video. Please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you've not done so already. Remember to let me know your thoughts, your theories and your opinions in the comments down below. Until next time, stay safe out there, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Bye!